Hi, everyone. Today I have with me Dr. Jessica DuPont, a fellow colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, um, <laughs> doula extraordinaire and the founder of York Region Naturopathic Doulas. Hi, Jess. Thanks for being here. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I love what you're doing. Um, I think this is such a great platform for women to learn all about, all about hormones and everything in between. And so I'm so blessed to be here. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm looking forward to you sharing all your wisdom. I, I reach out to you oftentimes when I have complex cases and, you know, I know you reach out to me. We chat a lot about <laughs> hormones basically. So I'm really excited to share that with everyone, but Great. let's start first with you sharing a little bit about yourself, the work that you do and the journey to where you are now. Sure. So um, I am a naturopathic doctor and a birth doula. I practice in Aurora, Newmarket area. So York region and uh, I'm also a fertility strategist. So a lot of my, um, or what I see in my practice starts from getting women pregnant to keeping them pregnant and healthy and having a beautiful baby at the end and uh, helping them go through the birth and labor as well and preparing them for a healthy delivery. And then I work with them postpartum as well, just to get kind of hormones on track, work with their mental health and emotional health and physical health. And uh, so kind of everything from beginning to end, which is nice. And I really love that. Uh, I am also the creator of the Baby Bloomers, which is an online platform for um, fertility and perinatal care. So I am currently relaunching my fertility program online, and I'll also be doing a couple of other programs that focus on um, pregnancy and having healthy delivery, and then also postpartum program as well. And really, this was born out of a real need for just supporting women. I don't think there's enough support out there. And I think that there's a lot of information that doctors don't tell them and that other people don't tell them that they really need to know. <laughs> and I think by, you know, nurturing healthy mothers, we'll also have healthier children and then healthier communities in the long run. So more of like a global health going on. So that's kind of my goal. And uh, like you said, I'm the owner of um, New York Region Naturopathic Doulas as well. So I have a few different things going on, lots of different stuff, <laughs> but it's fun. It's all good. Yeah, and you also yeah. just had a baby recently. <laughs> I did. I have um, two babies. I have a two and a half year old and a four month old. And so I feel like I started off in fertility, but then, you know, I'm sort of navigating more now too into, into motherhood and nurturing mothers because I am one. And so I feel like I can, I can really relate and I know where there's holes in terms of their health care. So uh, they keep me on my toes. <laughs> They're a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I love that. And, and I've also seen your practice evolve in that direction. And I love it because mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. There's so much need for support and women wanting support yeah. and, and support from credible, credible sources, right? And you're such a wealth of information because you, A, you're a mother and B, like you see the whole process, right? Like you see it from fertility and all the way through. Mm -hmm. So, and that's really why I wanted to bring you on. Plus, I love you. So uh, that's another oh. reason why I wanted to bring you on. So so, so let's so let's dive into some of these topics that I want really want to okay. uh, touch on today. So mm -hmm. can we first talk about how hormones change during pregnancy because then that'll set the stage for what happens after pregnancy? Yeah, sure. Um, you were a little bit choppy. I'm hoping I'm not, but am I okay? Okay. Yeah. So first of all, when you get pregnant, um, the first two hormones that shift the most are the progesterone and your estrogen. So estrogen and progesterone surge really high, really quickly. Um, both of these hormones help also create our happy neurotransmitters. So dopamine and serotonin. So a lot of women are very happy when they're pregnant. And that's the reason why. Uh, but so, not everybody, not everybody has a happy pregnancy, <laughs> but they can feel very happy. And that's usually because of the hormones that are at play. Uh, they can also make you very calm as well, which is nice. So estrogen, first and foremost, increases gradually over the first three trimesters. So in the first trimester, it can increase so much that it can cause a lot more nausea for women. So I think that that's why a lot of people, some people are like, why am I experiencing nausea and this person isn't? It could be because their estrogen level is just spiking way more quickly than other people's. Um, also in second trimester, Estrogen is responsible for the development of the milk ducts, and so women's breasts will begin to enlarge. And so there's a few other things that estrogen does. It actually even enables the uterus and the placenta to improve vascularization and bring like more blood flow and oxygen to the baby, increasing more formation of blood cells in the mother. 
It also helps with transfer of nutrients to the baby and, and supporting their development, which is kind of cool. Um, progesterone, on the other hand, works especially in the first trimester to help hold a pregnancy. So it's very good at doing that. We love progesterone, can't have too much of it. And uh, the changes in progesterone can actually cause a laxity or loosening of the ligaments and joints. So a lot of women will have more play in their joints or they'll eventually begin to waddle a little bit. And, and that's all preparing their body for labor, right? Because we need everything to kind of open up and be relaxed. And it can also cause the internal structures of the mother to increase. So it causes enlargement of the uterus, enlargement of the ureters. So it's like the, um, the tubes that connect the kidneys and the maternal bladder. So all of these things tend to enlarge as well, which is kind of neat. Okay. Thanks yeah. for that. That's such a nice, nice summary of estrogen and progesterone. <laughs> and I love talking about estrogen and progesterone because like, they're so complex. Like we try to like make sense of them so linearly, but they're so complex and interconnected. And that really shows in pregnancy and outside of pregnancy, like when we're talking about fertility, if we're not talking mm -hmm. about fertility, we're just talking about periods and then postpartum as well. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about the postpartum period and how hormones shift after pregnancy. And can mm -hmm. we touch on um, for women who may be breastfeeding and those who also may not be breastfeeding? Yeah, sure. So so all those hormones that kind of increased during pregnancy, the progesterone and the estrogen that are making you feel happy, now completely plummet after birth. <laughs> so during labor, so although labor is very beautiful and natural, it is also an inflammatory process and it takes a lot for your adrenal glands to work during labor. So it's a very high stressful event on your body physically. So it releases adrenaline and cortisol. So both of those are surging um, through the labor. And then what happens is you get this crash in progesterone and estrogen right after the birth. And this basically happens within the three days right after you have a baby. So there is no change in hormones more drastic than after a woman has a baby. Like it's just so fast. And um, what happens is the estrogen and progesterone drop, and this allows the other two hormones, prolactin and oxytocin, to, to raise. So oxytocin is like your love hormone. It's the hormone that helps you be connected to your baby. It also helps contract your uterus back to its uh, normal size pre-pregnancy. And, um, and then you have prolactin, which helps bring in your milk supply, right? So those are all very normal shifts in hormones after your baby comes. And basically, within the first three to six weeks, um, after three weeks or so, your postpartum hormones that were kind of going or kind of raising a bit to so like the oxytocin levels start going down. So those positive birth hormones start to drop. So after six weeks postpartum, we have to be very careful to watch if um, postpartum depression sits in. So that's a very key thing to remember. So if you can kind of imagine your body just going through all of these roller coasters of hormones and cortisol spiking, and then you combine that with lack of sleep with a newborn now, trying to navigate having a new baby at home, maybe you don't have you know, a great support team, women might be skipping meals or not staying hydrated. There are so many things at play that you could just imagine with like the adrenals and stress and then the other hormones going on that we have to be very careful in watching mood over time and being very careful to look at that, the discrepancy between um, baby blues and postpartum depression, right? So baby blues being more of kind of your emotional ups and downs that are very, I say normal after, <laughs> after pregnancy because they're, they're very common. You can be irritable, emotional, and you might just question and be like, this is not me. Like, why am I crying right now? Or why am I so frustrated? And that's just because you're, you're managing and you're coping the few weeks after delivery. But if beyond six weeks, this continues and then starts altering your way of life, you know, you're, you're not motivated to get out of bed or your anxiety is so high that you're not sleeping and you're constantly watching the baby to see if they're breathing and, um, you know, emotions are just so uncontrollable. So all of these things you have to be careful for because they could signify a, a deeper issue. Um, depression after pregnancy can uh, be a cause of hormonal fluctuations, but it can also be deficiencies like in magnesium and iron, protein, B vitamins. Um, it could be a big part of your thyroid hormone as well. So the thyroid hormone in your pregnancy also does become a little bit under functioning, which is very common. And then postpartum, it, could, it can stay the same. It can still or even go further into under functioning. 
usually because of the adrenal glands being at the root. But um, so we have to kind of look at, you know, what's going on in the mother and treat there, if that makes sense. So that's kind of like what we're looking for around the three to six week mark. Now, if you, um, I do want to talk about if you're breastfeeding versus not breastfeeding. So once you kind of hit, I'm going to get to that in a second, but once you kind of hit hormones at three months postpartum, that's when uh, hormones begin to reset to their kind of pre-pregnancy levels. So that's where you begin seeing the change. So a lot of women will experience hair loss because the estrogen that was super, super high in their pregnancy, giving them those luscious locks, uh, now is not there anymore. And so all of that hair begins to fall out and it will normalize in a few months. Usually by six months, you stop getting that, that crazy hair loss. But you can also see that cortisol starts to increase even more around the three month period because you're dealing with the stressors of having a baby at home too. And then with lack of sleep, you might get lower levels of melatonin secretion and that would lower the levels of serotonin, which again is your feel good neurotransmitter. Um, postpartum hormones at six months, you're looking at everything sort of going back to, I, I want to say normal, but uh, that's kind of what textbook says. I would say women are kind of dealing with postpartum stuff for at least a year after they have children or more. But this is where we start to see prolactin levels drop in breastfeeding women. So if you have been breastfeeding up to this point, this is, you know, you're now trying to introduce solids to the baby. So the demand on your breast gets a little bit lower. And so prolactin levels tend to drop. And when prolactin levels tend to drop, you um, will likely begin to ovulate again and eventually have a period. So some women's periods can return at this point. And then um, if you're not breastfeeding, this happens a lot sooner. So basically your prolactin levels will begin to normalize within a, the first few weeks after delivery. And women can actually have um, a period within six to eight weeks postpartum. So it's a lot quicker and your hormones regulating postpartum if you're not breastfeeding happens a lot faster. So you can imagine like the longer you're breastfeeding for, um, the longer your hormones are gonna be suppressed. So that's something to remember. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, you definitely do want to look for, you know, if there's anxiety or depression, if there's low libido, weight gain, cysts or fibroids, chronic fatigue, all of these things uh, could indicate that there's a hormone imbalance that might not be quite normal postpartum. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about menses and how that might be different for, for women kind of postpartum? Yeah, I'd love to talk about yeah how periods can change afterwards or even cycles and their cyclical symptoms might change um, after pregnancy. Yeah, so, so it can, again, depend if you're breastfeeding or not. So like I said, if you're not breastfeeding, you can have a period within six to eight weeks after you have your baby. Um, once you are breastfeeding, it can happen later. So I would say anywhere from six months and afterward, you'll probably have your period. And this all depends on your milk supply, how frequent you're feeding your baby as well, or if you're combining formula and breast milk. So if you're also, if you are combining formula and breast milk, you might, um, sorry, Anne, you're frozen for a second. Oh, you okay? You good? Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you're combining breast milk and formula, your prolactin levels may drop sooner and therefore your, your milk might dry up sooner. Your other hormones might surge sooner and you might get a period sooner. So my period didn't come back until 13 months postpartum and I breastfed until my son was 22 months. So it does range for every woman. So that's something to keep in mind. But when your period comes back, it's not normally the way it was before you got pregnant. It could be worse. It could also be better. Like usually if you're somebody who has endometriosis, your periods tend to be better once you, once they first come back because, you know, the estrogen hasn't really been there to <laughs> cause and wreak more of the havoc. So, um, but normally what we do see is that women can experience more um, cramping. They could be stronger. It could be lighter than usual. You might have smaller blood clots heavier flow, um, a flow that seems to kind of stop and start because the hormones aren't necessarily spiking and dipping to their maximum points necessarily. So you might ovulate one cycle and not the next cycle. So it can look very sporadic and irregular. And I think that what causes kind of the mildly painful postpartum periods is because your uterus is now larger. So there's more tissue to shed. 
um, during your menstruation. Also, the hormones of breastfeeding will cause more increased intensity in uterine contractions, right? So the cramping will be a little bit more intense. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted to touch on lochia at all, but what women can expect kind of right immediately postpartum is lochia or vaginal discharge after birth up to six weeks that they deliver. And this is the same if you've had a C-section, this is the same if uh, you've had a vaginal delivery, breastfeeding or not. Um, you could bleed up to six weeks. The first three days are your most um, dominant days in terms of dark red blood. You might have clots, nothing larger than the size of like a plum or a um, golf ball. And then, you know, a few days after that, it'll move towards being more pinkish or brownish and watery. And then it'll be more creamy and white. So it eventually gets kind of lighter and lighter. But women kind of call me panicking sometimes because they go, you know, I wasn't bleeding for like a week. And now all of a sudden, it's like I have my period again. Um, and this might be just because of breastfeeding. So the more you breastfeed, you might find you have more lochia. And then also if they become more active. So sometimes women think that if their bleeding is tapering off, that's a go to kind of go back to the gym and, or start doing heavier lifting and stuff, but that's actually a big no-no. You want to give yourself six weeks and get the permission from your practitioner in order to do so, um, but that could also cause the increase in lochia as well. Perfect. I love that you touched on so many different things and talked about breastfeeding and not breastfeeding and, and all the variations within that, because a lot of women do like, even if they start breastfeeding, they might like transfer over to half formula, half breastfeeding. Everyone, you know, makes different choices yeah. based on what's happening in their bodies, what's happening in life and their personal preferences. So I'm really happy that you touched on that mm -hmm. and the hair loss and everything, because hair loss at postpartum is such a big, <laughs> big thing, right? Like, because you're shedding so much all at it's once. real, guys. I'm going through it right now <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you it's in like my kids food it's like <laughs> everywhere <laughs> so um so are there any blood work or assessments or other healthcare practitioners that you'd recommend women see um if like while they're in the postpartum yeah. period and that could be routine because I know I send a lot of women for routine follow-ups but also if they are experiencing symptoms, what does your um, care recommendation look like? Right, so basically at the six week point is where I usually send women for uh, their iron levels, their B12 levels, their thyroid hormones as well, and not just the upward hormones, but all of their downward hormones for the thyroid and antibody testing, just to make sure and look at a baseline because things might shift after that. Um, and usually I, I might test blood sugar, not necessarily though, depending on their symptoms. Um, that's probably what I test the most critically at the six week point. But if there are symptoms, especially of if I'm, if I'm thinking about hormones and stuff like that, I don't normally test hormones at six weeks because women are normally breastfeeding the inlet. So if they're not breastfeeding, then I can give it a few months before testing, but it doesn't really make sense to test your hormones while you're breastfeeding. It's just not really going to give you the best accurate result. So what I do look at, though, is could there potentially be anything else going on that could be contributing to their issues? So looking at blood sugar, looking at gut dysbiosis, right? So could there be um, a gut dysbiosis going on, food sensitivities that could be contributing? We know toxic heavy metals also could have an effect on postpartum depression, um, I might do a 24 hour cortisol test to see kind of how they're doing with their adrenal glands. So those are some things that I do consider in terms of assessment. And also just, um, as a note too, we usually know if something pre-pregnancy or pre, um, pre-pregnancy and then also during pregnancy is going on, that's maybe setting them up for something down, down the road. So if there's already this underlying depression or underlying anxiety, and that's something we kind of plan for and we can prevent going into postpartum. So that's something to be really conscious of. And um, I think you were asking also about healthcare professionals that I recommend. So I usually always 100% recommend a pelvic floor physiotherapist. <laughs> so as we know, delivering a baby um, can be very hard on our pelvic floor. You know, we could have issues with urination and incontinence, uh, painful bowel movements, you know, all because the muscles of the pelvic floor are just so relaxed and those organs can become prolapsed as well. And so pelvic floor physiotherapists are amazing at just assessing where a woman might be tight or too loose in terms of their, their muscles in that area and giving great exercise to kind of build back up. 
Um, I love acupuncture. I think acupuncture is a fantastic way of normalizing hormones. Um, that's a very safe for pregnant women. Because as you know, we do use herbs and things, but they might not be, as, some of them we can't do, you know, with, because of breastfeeding. So I love acupuncture for that reason. Chiropractic care and massage therapy, any type of body work, <laughs> because labor and delivery is not easy. And, uh, you know, you're, you might have back pain and, you, and especially with breastfeeding, you know, your posture is always like this and you might start to get neck pain and migraines. And so I think body work is great. Seeing a naturopath is also great just because they can give a really complex or sorry, comprehensive overview of what could be going on and do critical testing that, you know, your medical doctor or specialist may not order. So I think that's important too. So those are probably the main ones I recommend. I'm trying to think if I forgot anybody. I mean, there's always osteopath for baby. That's uh, I love osteopath for baby or Bowen therapy for baby, especially if they're having reflux issues and stuff like that. So yeah, lots of be, see everyone. <laughs> Basically, yeah, like a comprehensive care makes a huge difference, though, right? Like, and if you've had a vaginal birth yeah. or you've had a C-section, because even with a C-section, right, there's so much tissue changes that have that happened. Mm. There's like there might be fluid retention. Um, there's so many aspects to cover, and manual work also for relaxation and for mental health too, right? Like, there's yeah. so many changes going on, and depending on your what your support system looks like. They can be more important for some some women, and, and it really is a personal preference as well. But I, look, similar to you, like those are the people that I recommend. And as naturopaths, like we have this, you know, we can look at it, everything from a bird's eye view and take a look not just at you know the symptoms, but also like what what food is going into your system. What how are you drinking water? Are you drinking enough water? Are you actually like moving and mm -hmm. what what everything is like and connect that back. So can we talk a little bit about how? Sure how um, food and hydration and sleep play into the health. I know you touched on this a little bit earlier, but also like the typical um, or the, the usual um, trends that you see in women, because I know I see women who might not be drinking enough water sometimes. Food yeah. intake is really irregular, especially like in these times, COVID-19 times where, you know, um, you're not having people come over to kind of support you in that way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So right now is a very interesting time for, for women. <laughs> um, even going through pregnancy is hard. You know, they're not getting their um, baby showers. They're, you know, when, when somebody should be kind of like helping them and supporting them, they may not be able to even go to a pelvic floor physio. They may not be able to go get massage. And that can be very difficult. And then, you know, during the birth as well, women aren't even allowed to have their doulas present right now. So we're actually helping women virtually, which is a whole other level. <laughs> but um, so already you see the support to go down for a lot of these women during this time. And this is their most critical time where they need support. And so we're, we're trying to help women as much as we can in terms, in terms of their mental, emotional health and their physical health right now. Um, but when it comes to postpartum, one of the biggest things that we do as moms, and it's very natural, is to just be all about the baby, right? Is the baby eating? Is the baby pooping? Is the baby sleeping? Um, are, are they gaining weight? You know, we just become so much about the baby that we forget to take care of ourselves. And I say that lightly because I don't necessarily think that a woman needs to take care of herself in postpartum. That's only part of it. Like she also needs to be taken care of. You know, so putting together like a critical support team and having that support team uh, in place in advance can be very important. I know right now it might not be easy for family members to come over, but it's very easy to have somebody just drop off meals at the front door for the family, um, virtual meetings with breastfeeding, cons like lactation consultants or doulas to just make sure that they're watching you breastfeed, making sure that latch is going well. So um, there's a lot of things that we can do to support women and have that support in place. And of course, your partners are such uh, critical resources as well. So in terms of sleep, um, if you can kind of imagine, sleep affects us in two ways. So like fatigue, if you're feeling tired, that's going to basically um, make you raise your cortisol. So your cortisol is going to go up even more. So again, your adrenal glands are going to become affected. That might uh, stop you from skipping meals as well throughout the day and then craving carbohydrates. And then when you eat those carbohydrates, you're going to have a spike in blood sugar and then a drop in blood sugar. And that's going to further deplete the adrenal glands. 
and cause more um, hormonal, ref hormonal changes, right? Because your blood sugar is going to be kind of all over the place. So keeping that blood sugar steady is going to be really important. Um, the other thing too, if you're not sleeping, you're going to again get that decrease in melatonin and then um, a decrease in serotonin levels. So a decrease in those feel-good neurotransmitters. So we need to, what I always say is try sleep banking. So a lot of people think that if they lose sleep, they can never catch it, like get it back. That's actually not true. Um, you can. So what I recommend women do is 50% of the time that baby's sleeping, they should sleep as well. So I understand that, you know, they want to take a shower and they want to eat and they want to do house chores and stuff like that. Get to that. I mean, eating of course is important, but, um, 50% of the time they should be sleeping, even if it's just 40 minutes, bank that 40 minutes because overnight your baby's going to be waking frequently and you'll be able to manage getting up, you know, every couple of hours a lot easier if you're sleeping. <clears throat> In terms of diet, uh, making sure that your diet is really spot on is really critical. I find that a lot of women reach to just what's easy and that might be just like a muffin or, uh, you know, bready, carby type things, which Carbohydrates are fine, but we want healthier carbohydrates, right? So reaching for more fruit, uh, nuts and seeds, um, whole grains, that and maybe with like nut butters and healthy proteins so that um, you can keep your energy up and keep your milk supply up. So basically each meal should contain a really healthy protein, healthy fats, lots of fruits and vegetables. So you're getting a lot of those minerals and amino acids and antioxidants, and then keeping your blood sugar level right? Because if you're just eating muffins and having candy or chocolate and giving into all these cravings, it's going to set you up for failure in the end, even though temporarily it might make you feel good. And it can be very easy as a new mom to forget to eat. And so if partners can be just very aware of mom always having a bowl of something in the area where she normally breastfeeds her baby. So that's what I always did. I always had just a bowl of veggies and hummus or some nuts and seed or some cut up fruit. Uh, just in a bowl and I would feed Oliver or Ben and while I was feeding him I would eat myself so that was kind of a good reminder as well baby was eating I was eating and then always to drink 500 mils of water as soon as you're done breastfeeding to replenish the the milk because um, hydration is so critical and not only your mood uh, but also keeping your breast milk supply up and if your breast milk supply is up you're usually a happier mom you have a healthier happier baby <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, so it is very critical, all those pieces, more so than any type of supplement or, or anything like that. Just really making sure your foundation is healthy. And when your foundation is healthy, that your baby's foundation is healthy, right? I love that. I love the, how you said that when baby's eating, you're eating. Because yes. that's, that's such an easy thing to remember, right? Like, okay, baby's eating, I'm going to eat at the same time. And then I'm just going to drink water right after because baby just hydrated. So yeah. so that's, that's a really nice tip for people. What other... Um, practical or real life advice and tips do you recommend for for women right now and in general um, who have just had babies or recently have babies or have like little kids at home yeah so for definitely for sure i always tell my clients to sleep when baby sleeps that was like one of the, one of the biggest things easier said than done for a lot of women especially if you have toddlers <laughs> <laughs> so if your toddler is still having nap time, that's kind of like your time to, to nap. Give baby to your partner and you need to rest because sometimes toddlers don't give you the rest. Um, but if your toddler is like mine and just very active and wanting me all the time, uh, something I've been trying to do more of is getting my husband to take my toddler out outside for an hour or go for a drive just so that I can have a little bit of kind of more me time or me and Oliver time at home. Um, especially in the beginning phases, that bonding experience between the mom and the baby is so critical, and it's especially in establishing uh, a good latch and good breastfeeding um, habits. So I normally recommend for women to not, like, although we want support, I usually say not to have tons of visitors at the home because um, the more visitors there are, the more it can disrupt your rhythm in trying to get to know your baby's schedule, but also them getting to know you. And it can always be a very loud or anxiety provoking time for baby to try to feed when other people are around. So unless that person coming over is helping with, you know, prepping a meal or helping clean the house or helping you in any way, those people should really be delayed until, you know, maybe two weeks after <laughs> you've had the baby and you've established a good latch. Um, and just staggering those visits too. So you don't have like 10 people in your house because that could be very overwhelming immediately postpartum. 
Um, if you have an, a toddler, I usually suggest baby wearing a lot because if you have a toddler, you're gonna need both hands free. So ba having a baby carrier has been a savior for us, even in terms of just like getting meals ready and on the stove. Um, taking some time for yourself and asking for help. Those are very hard to do postpartum, I can say. I'm very guilty of not asking for help too. And, but my husband is very good at reminding me to ask for help. <laughs> but uh, we have so many support networks out there. You know, there's so many other women who are going through the same thing, uh, who, can, who can support you. There's, you know, perhaps you have a sister or a good friend who you can, you can lean on, even if you just need to talk to someone. And uh, so definitely asking for help is really important. And then aside from that, lots of skin to skin and uh, look into a postpartum doula, right? If, 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 like, especially right now, I realize that they can't necessarily come into your home, but some can uh, because some, some do consider it an essential service. And um, I think that even just speaking to somebody through Zoom can be comforting and answering some of your questions that might be giving you anxiety or that's worrying you, right? So Yeah, I love that. Um, mm -hmm there yeah it's it's a hard time but it's a hard time for everybody so tapping into the resources that you really can at this time and i know even like for for us right like for for the general population just connecting with someone or just talking through something is so helpful because there's only so much like i can talk to my husband about because i'm going to get the same perspective right you also need different yeah. perspectives and you also want to talk to people who might be going through the same thing so connecting mm -hmm. to, to those kinds of people can be so helpful do you have any Absolutely. other resources that um, that you recommend to new moms, whether that be books or podcasts or people to follow? Definitely follow Jess, everybody. Oh, <laughs> I'll, gosh, I'll, so I'll throw in I'll throw in um, her links in the description for this video. Yeah. So somebody that I've actually been really enjoying following lately is um, Belle Method. I, do you know who she is, Nikki? Yeah. Um, she's just really great at helping. With, she has programs for pregnancy and postpartum that can just help with pelvic floor and exercise programs to help women kind of uh, get rid of some of that back pain and hip pain that they're feeling, uh, get the baby aligned into uh, the right position. So um, she's on Instagram, she has all her videos on Instagram. I think she's on YouTube as well. Like she's got a really good uh, network. So I really like her. Um, I really do like Lalesh League, of course. Lalesh League is gonna be a fantastic resource for breastfeeding women. And uh, so any questions you have about breastfeeding, the Little Lash League is amazing. Um, Sarah Snyder Fitness is someone, you, I know you know Sarah. She's wonderful at just um, helping women through pregnancy and postpartum. She's got a lot of programs for women, one-on-one uh, -on -one and in group. And I love the group programs because it helps you kind of um, connect with other moms too. And she usually brings in speakers to talk to the group so you can learn a lot. Um, Angelica Longo, she's a sleep consultant that I've worked with. She's amazing. She's not about the whole cry it out method, <laughs> um, but she's so good at letting you understand uh, the rhythm of a baby's sleep and understanding what's normal and what might not be normal. So she uh, decreased my anxiety a lot. I really like her. Um, there's also the Postpartum Support International. So this is um, a group that helps a lot of women with mental health. It, like after pregnancy and so I definitely recommend going onto their website or onto their Instagram and just um, getting some support there I'm trying to think who else uh, Viva Ram is a wonderful resource so she's um, a medical doctor but she has a very holistic perspective for those who don't know I mean sure, I'm sure everyone knows who Viva Ram is but, <laughs> but if you don't I mean she's not just about pregnancy and postpartum but she has a lot of stuff there um, in terms of podcasts there's one called Birthful I really like their podcast and also there's one called the longest shortest time because you know it's you know as mothers we I think we take advantage a lot of our kids when they're little and we're like oh I just wish this was all over with right now <laughs> but then you know they move through those moments and it's like oh that happened so fast you know and it's it's kind of like you feel like it's so long but then when it's over it's like oh it was actually so short and I really like their they're very honest in their podcasts so I really like them too um, and I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. I mean, those are the people I'm probably looking at the most right now, but there's so many, right? There's just so many out there. Yeah. I mean, even yeah, you have a going now, right? So it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks, Jess. And thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom with us. Thank you for like taking everything to everyone through like the hormonal changes and how, what that looks mm -hmm. like in real life and practically and sharing those practical tips that that women can implement in their lives. Where can people find you? Where can they come hang out from you with you and learn from you? And um, yeah, share, share where, where people can connect with you. Sure. So, I mean, you can definitely connect with me through my website. So, um, and I'll put the link there, but it's drjessicand.com. And um, you can connect with me there, but I'll, probably on my social media is where you're going to see the most in terms of my posts and everything and the information. So my Instagram is where I post everything the most. Um, so it's at Dr. Jessica DuPont and that's DR, not uh, spelling out doctor. And uh, I do share it to my Facebook page, so you can always go on there too. Um, the Baby Bloomers page focuses specifically on pregnancy and postpartum. So um, I encourage you to come to that community and, and help support women there too, and maybe see kind of what other women are going through. Um, my fertility program will be launching very shortly and other programs launching in the future. So keep your mind out for those. But that's probably the best way to find me. Um, I will be starting a YouTube channel very shortly, which I'm excited about. <laughs> this is getting me all prepared for being on camera. So this is great. <laughs> um, be great. Ho I'm hoping I can just, um, I guess, fill some of those holes that a lot of, like there's just so much information out there that people aren't getting or misinformation. And so I just want to make sure that women know what to expect, or I guess like what to expect after they're expecting. <laughs> If that makes sense yeah. because I think what is it one like we have maybe six or seven prenatal visits and then once you move into postpartum there's one like there's literally one postnatal visit and it's usually focused on the baby you know yeah. it's not even asking the mom how she's doing <laughs> so that's it's terrible you know I think we really need to change that I agree. Yeah. And, and that's why a lot of women also lean are leaning more towards midwives, but the midwives are at full capacity because mm. the midwives do do bring a little bit more continuity of care afterwards and really are taking care of yes. mom and baby checking in on both. Um, and Absolutely. having a, a doula can be helpful, like having a naturopath, obviously, we're big advocates of that. Um, yeah, so I will definitely throw those links in um, the description to this video to find Jess and connect with her. And I'm looking forward to all the things that you're uh, that you're working on. And when they come into the world, I'll definitely share those as you well. You too. 